Good afternoon. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Eric Porcho, Institutional Advancement Director for the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation. On behalf of the Foundation, welcome to today's, today's webinar, Cost Effective and Sustainable Packing, Moving, and Storage. This webinar is part of FAIC's Professional Development Program, meeting the needs of mid-career conservation and collections care professionals. Funding for the presentation of this program was provided by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Additional funding was provided by the Foundation of the American Institute for Conservation, uh, in the, the Endowment for Professional Development, which is in turn supported by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and donations from members and friends of AIC. AIC membership dues were not used to prepare or present this event. This grant and endowment funding helps keep FAIC's programs affordable. Your registration fee represents less than half the direct costs of presenting the program. Also, if you have not already done so, we encourage you to register for the companion piece to this webinar, examining the environmental impact of exhibitions and loans using the lifestyle analysis tool. And that will take place next week, Tuesday, December 8th, and is also co-presented by the AIC Sustainability Committee. Before we start, I have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, today's presentation will be recorded. A link will be sent to all registrants, and a copy will eventually be made openly available on our YouTube channel. Questions will be collected through the questions chat box found in the control panel on the right side of your screen. We're going to read the questions out loud so that everybody can hear and the panelists will be able to respond. And most questions will be held until the end of the program. If your control panel, that right-hand panel, closes, you can open it again by clicking on the small tab in the upper right corner of your screen. And if you want to keep the control panel open at all times, uh, go up to the top, click on View on that tab, and then uncheck the Auto Hide the Control Panel option. So the default usually is that it will hide if you haven't used it for a while. Your viewing screen, where the program slides appear, can be made larger or smaller by clicking and dragging the lower right-hand corner. Well, FAIC thanks the organizers and instructors who are sharing their time and talents with us all so generously. We are so glad that you could be here today, and I now turn the microphone over to Geneva Griswold. Uh, as soon as I unmute her. There we go. All right. Hello, everyone. On behalf of the AIC Sustainability Committee and my co-host, Christian Hernandez, I would like to thank you all for attending today's webinar. Um, the final program is 90 minutes in length. The first hour's presentations will address how institutions reduced waste during packing for exhibition or collections move, developments in green housing and storage solutions, and useful systems for organizing materials during these processes. So as Eric mentioned, we do encourage you to type questions into the chat bar during the program. Eric may pose a few of these between speakers, and the rest will be collected for a final Q&A session at the end. Additionally, several polls will be initiated throughout to better understand your needs and interests. As Eric brings up the first poll, I would like to introduce our first speaker. Simon Lambert is a co-founder of ReOrg and the Preservation Development Advisor for the Canadian Conservation Institute, with a focus on preventive conservation and experience in a variety of international collections care projects. Simon, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Is it good? Right now, we're looking at the poll. OK. <laughs> Let's see. Has everybody had a chance to respond to the poll? Uh, yes, I guess 95% have voted. 71% uh, of our audience are from museums and historic sites, 13% from libraries and archives, and 5% each for the other three choices. Okay. 
And we have a second poll we'd like you to uh, respond to. And what role do you play within your institution? We have about 88% have voted so far, and uh, the middle choice, the member of a conservation team at an institution, was selected by 41%. 24% are other staff at an institution with a conservator on staff. 16% are not at an institution um, or in private practice. 14% are other staff without a conservator. and. 5% are all alone conservators at an institution. And uh, Simon, you should have the screen. Uh, you have to hide the poll results to enable screen sharing. Okay, sorry. Let's see. That's okay. There, that should do it. Okay, can you see my screen? I think yes. we're good. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Simon Lambert, and I'm from CCI, and oops, I'm going to be talking about sustainability and storage reorganization. Um, I just want to acknowledge the work um, uh, that was done uh, to develop Reorg, which is a step-by-step -step tool to reorganize storage that I'll be briefly introducing later. I want to acknowledge the work of the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property, or ECROM, and also uh, UNESCO. So without further ado, um, most of you or some of you uh, will be familiar with this diagram, which shows um, the three dimensions of, of sustainability. So we have the social, the environmental, the economic, and uh, various overlappings of, of those dimensions also as well. So what I'm going to be focusing on today is mostly on environmental and economic, um, although I promise at the end I will get into the social a little bit as well. Uh, but mainly, to be, to be sustainable, there should be kind of a, a productive balance between all three dimensions, and that's what we call sustainable. Um, now, I want to invite you to think about uh, storage areas that you might have seen or that you either work in or hopefully for those who are alone in their <laughs> alone conservators in their, their institutions, uh, if, if this kind of picture looks familiar or um, uh, you know, resembles a situation that you have seen, I hope that uh, it's not quite as bad in your institution. Uh, but this is a disorganized storage area that we can see here. And I thought that to begin this talk, I would think about, um, you know, in, in applying the reorg methodology, how would I go about it doing, doing it in an unsustainable way? So how could I do an unsustainable reorg? And that'll help us kind of figure out how to do it in a sustainable way. So first of all, if I'm looking at uh, reorganize, reorganizing my storage, and basically my building is is still okay, um, I would probably try to build a new fancy storage facility, um, you know, with all the bells and whistles. Even though I don't maybe need I, I don't need one. Um, another thing that I might do um, to be unsustainable, well, this. As a consequence, uh, building a brand new fancy building would uh, really impact my carbon footprint. So you'd have a lot of embodied carbon in those materials that you're using, and you'll learn all about those probably next week uh, during the talk about the uh, life cycle tool for museum loans. Uh, but you'd have a, basically a, a bigger impact on the environment by doing that. And maybe what you might do as well, 
uh, is kind of uh, add some big windows so that it makes it really challenging to control the environment in my storage spaces. So you do all those kinds of features that would really increase that impact on the environment. You might also leave all the lights on and that could be also beneficial by fading your collections. All the things that are most sensitive to light damage would get a double bang for their buck. Um, you might also try to replace everything, even though it's still good and it still works fine for the collection, it's still safe for the collection, with conservation grade materials because you just need conservation grade materials. So you would replace all your wooden shelving with you know, powder coated metallic shelving. You would replace all your acidic boxes by acid free boxes with acid free tissue. And that would increase also the amount of materials that, you're, uh, you know, that go into your carbon footprint. And you would also be sending extra things to the landfill. So you really are getting a double benefit here. So that's great. Um, also what you might do is you might specify tighter RH control and temperature control than you need. So if you have uh, plus or minus 10 all year round or if you're able to manage it, uh, your, your RH to keep it between 75 and 25 year, all year round and your collection, you're seeing no damage in your collection and everything seems fine. Um, you're actually going to try to specify 55 uh, plus or minus 2 or plus or minus 2.5 all year round to increase your energy bill, to increase your production of carbon emissions, and to make a hole in your pockets. Um, so that's how you would go about being unsustainable in a storage reorg for those three elements. Uh, you'd want a wasteful building, a wasteful use of materials and fittings, uh, and a wasteful use of um, climate control, wasteful climate control. So sustainable choices, if we're going to make sustainable choices, where, where's a good starting point for determining what I need, what I don't need, what's nice to have, what's essential to have, uh, you know, where to, uh, where to begin. So I think the most uh, important principle that, that, that we need to focus on is the vulnerability of the collection. So <clears throat> your collection, which is represented by this green box, um, which may no look nothing like your collection, but it's still your collection, and, and you have the agents of deterioration in the red box. And so the overlap between the collection and your uh, agents of deterioration is that area of vulnerability. So what this means is your collection might not be all vulnerable to the same agents or to the same degree. And so it's when you're trying to decide, you know, do I need that acid-free box, it's to understand, well, the materials that I'm, I have in my collection, are they vulnerable? Are they sensitive to that agent, which is pollutants? So are they sensitive to those um, acids? So a really quick and dirty way of, of looking at this, which you probably already know, is splitting uh, organic and inorganic. And this is just a very broad generalization of uh, different agents of deterioration on the left side. And just what parts of the, like which part of the collection of organic and inorganic are more sensitive or vulnerable to those agents. So you can see just very quickly, and you can contest these. There's, there's always exceptions, but this is just a generalization. Um, you know, the organic materials are going to be more vulnerable or sensitive to most of the agents. So already, that's a good starting point to understand. You know, looking at your collection as a whole, is it mostly organic or mostly inorganic? And I'm going to be focusing on these three agents because that's the one we highlighted before. So it has to do with the building, with the fittings, the materials, the, the climate control. And so one of the ways that you can go even deeper into this study of the vulnerability is by going to our website. <laughs> the Canadian Conservation Institute website has a section in the Preventive Conservation and Agents page on the different agents. So one of them that I'm going to show now is called Incorrect Relative Humidity. And you'll get all the links to, uh, that are mentioned at the bottom of the page. You'll get them in a document after this webinar, so you don't have to sit there and write them down. Uh, but if I go in the incorrect relative humidity section, uh, I'll find that there are four different types of incorrect relative humidity. So there's relative humidity above 75%. That's where you're uh, experiencing an increase uh, mold, mold risk. Um, there's another incorrect relative humidity is critical RH. So some types of material uh, don't 
very much like to be outside of a certain range of RH. So either they like it uh, above a certain value or below a certain value or exactly at a certain value. So this is the case with a lot of mineral collections and you'll see um, you know, minerals kind of start starting to crumble after it gets too humid or too dry. And so that's a specific problem. There's also another other type of incorrect relative humidity and that's the RH above zero. And that sounds a bit strange, uh, but when you have any water vapor at all in the air, certain materials really don't like it. Um, a lot of archival materials, uh, <clears throat> magnetic media, um, uh, some paper-based materials, uh, because uh, the water reacts with those materials and start to degrade them internally. So these are inherently chemically unstable materials that really don't like any humidity at all. So a drier environment is preferable for them. And then another kind of incorrect relative humidity is the one that we're, we're most made comfortable with or talk about more is the RH fluctuations. So that's when plus or minus five, plus or minus 10, plus or minus 25. This is <clears throat> what normally comes to mind when you think of, it, of incorrect relative humidity, but that's just one of the four kinds. And the reason why I'm giving you all this information and introduction is because on that web page of uh, the CCI website, if you go into the relative humidity section, you'll find this lovely table here. Um, it was actually four tables for, for the four different types of incorrect relative humidity. And if I'm trying to find out what are the things that I need to be more concerned about in my collections, um, in my collection, then I use these tables this way. So I go from right to left, whoops, I go from right to left. So the very high sensitivity, sensitivity things, um, and that is sensitivity to RH above 75%. So I'm looking at the right column first. Do I have any things like this in my collection? If I do, then I need to focus on these specifically for um, you know, sensitivity to high RH. And then I can go down and look at the ones that are medium and low. Um, but I'm always focusing on the very high first, just to see as a first step, do I have any of these things? If I do, then I need to be worried a little bit about them. Um, and then I need to do more investigation. So critical RH, again, uh, you see that there's nothing applicable here, so don't need to worry about that one. Um, and then, oops, RH above 0%. So the first things I'm gonna be looking at uh, are there in the right column, um, and I'm working my way after that uh, towards the right for the things that are a little bit less problematic. Same thing for incorrect temperature. So I'm going to be looking at the things that are in the right column first. Do I have any of these things? If I do, then these are more problematic. So when you start to understand where the parts of your collection that are most vulnerable to that agent, then that's when you can start to make choices about, you know, are those, are there any things that need a special environment or is, is all of my collection, does it require a special environment or only parts of it? So that's where you start to parcel off the, prob the problem and really target what needs to be targeted first. Uh, another question that we had uh, was about the building. So that's one of the areas where I could be really unsustainable. And when I said, when my building is still okay and still safe for the collection. So uh, let's say I have three different collections and they are currently located here in my building. So I have my ceramics in the attic, the textiles in front of a window, and the archives in the damp basement. So are there things that I can do as part of a storage reorg to improve the conservation conditions for those collections without necessarily building a new building? Well, I could send the textiles in a room that doesn't have windows, or I could just block the windows. Um, I could send my archival material out of the basement and into a drier space. Um, and the ceramics are probably fine, probably ev everywhere. <laughs> so I could put them somewhere else. Um, so that's kind of a you know, very quick, quick way of, of, of talking about that aspect. Um, the uh, fittings and materials issue. So that's the pollutants uh, agent. And what we really need to be concerned about first are the most acid sensitive objects. It's mostly an acidity problem. So a lot of the materials that we use for storage or for 
uh, to coat our walls or our floors, uh, we use for boxes, for shelving units, all of those things, um, some of them release acid, acid vapors and acidic vapors. And many objects, or I should say some objects, are particularly sensitive to that. So we have a list here of those kinds of objects that are the most acid sensitive objects. That's not to say there aren't others, but these are the ones that react the most. So metals, color photographs, some papers that aren't already acidic. Um, shells, coral, limestone, cellulose, acetate. So these are the things that are to worry about first when you're selecting object, uh, you're selecting products and materials for storage. <clears throat> and what we're mostly concerned about here is prolonged contact with between those acid sensitive objects and the products that release acidic vapors or being in an enclosure with very few air exchanges. Um, so those acid sensitive objects being in enclosures that are made of these materials that are that release the acidic vapors. So these materials can be things that are like wood or wood products. Um, the most problematic wood is probably oak and then you have a whole range of different degrees of acidity that's released by other types of wood or wood products. <clears throat> Coatings, uh, things like oil paints, one part epoxies, moisture cured urethanes are the most problematic when they are either in contact or in presence of acid sensitive objects in a tight enclosure. Uh, cardboard, you know, mostly acidic boxes uh, when they are in contact with acidic sensitive objects. Um, plastics, you know, PVC, cellulose acetate, vulcanized rubbers, uh, etc. Um, those being, again, in contact or in enclosures with those acid sensitive objects. And the same thing for foams. So it's not to say that <clears throat> we need to get rid of all of our wooden shelving, we need to get rid of all of our acid sensitive boxes, our acid um, acidic boxes. Uh, it really depends on what's actually in contact with them and what is actually in them. So if you want to deepen this uh, understanding of the interaction between acid sensitive objects and products, uh, I encourage you to visit our website again under the uh, agents of deterioration, the pollutants section, and also this uh, nice uh, technical bulletin written by Jean Tétrault, um, about coatings for display and storage in museums. And the links are there for um, you to download this for free. Oops. So uh, why reorg is a sustainable approach? So why are we promoting um, uh, a sustainable approach within a storage reorganization? Well, just as a reminder, that storage reorganization is uh, when you start from a situation of complete chaos and you try to create order within the same space. So it's not the same thing as storage planning where you have a collection and you have a nice new empty space and then you want to put that collection inside the empty space. That's storage planning, but we're interested in reorganization. So the advantages of reorg is that you're using your existing infrastructure and you are reusing existing fittings and materials when they are safe. And I encourage you, all of you to go and visit reorg.info, um, which is a website that has all of the reorg materials where you see, you'll be able to uh, see the step-by-step -step, uh, reorg methodology. Uh, and I just want to say that later in 2016 on the ECROM website, we'll be able to uh, publish a new resource. So it's a reorg museums workbook. So it's a step-by-step. -step. It's even more uh, user-friendly than whatever was on the website. So it's, it's more of a workbook approach where you can take some worksheets with you and work inside your storage area. And this will be available electronically um, in 2016. So be on the lookout for this resource. Now I just want to show you some examples of what we're talking about. So some reorg participants who have undergone um, uh, reorg training, uh, the kind of solutions that they came up with in their own storage areas. So 
uh, just really creative use of materials that you wouldn't think to be safe for collections. Here we have two by fours um, used in various ways to store long and skinny objects on the left. Uh, here uh, in the middle, uh, shelving units made entirely out of plywood and uh, two by fours protected with um, an ethafoam lining. Um, and we have uh, on the right a uh, canoe uh, stand that was made with two by fours and uh, various padding materials. Here's another example of uh, using kind of commonly available materials and that you wouldn't think are you know storage materials uh, to store a collection. And here, so this is a, a wooden crate that was repurposed and covered with uh, cotton fabric and uh, on which chains were hung uh, to get a collection of masks that was previously being stored on the ground. And so uh, just by using very simple, uh, readily available materials, we're able to create a sustainable, uh, sorry, a very, a, a better condition to store these, uh, these collections. <clears throat> and here's another storage idea. Uh, from New Caledonia, and this is just the adaptation of a uh, just regular shelving unit uh, to store objects that are, again, long and thin. Um, so there's different ways to use the materials that you have, and it doesn't mean that you, uh, you don't always need to buy something custom built, uh, you know, that's museum standard. <laughs> there's a lot that you can do with the materials that you have, and I think that's what I'm trying to say to you, to you today. Um, so I did promise that we look at the social element, and I want to show that now. Um, we in Canada have been doing a Reorg Canada training program, and that we've selected five institutions that are spread across uh, the province of Ontario as a first project, and these these institutions are all working at the same time together uh, on a storage reorg in their own museums. So throughout the year. Uh, and this pro pro sorry, this project just ended uh, recently in uh, October, and throughout the year, so from October 2014 to 2015, they've been working on their projects, and um, they have really uh, taken this and ran with it. Uh, they have engaged their community in their reorgs. Uh, they've used their Facebook pages to highlight the progress. Uh, they've opened up their galleries. Uh, that they, temp they use as temporary swing spaces uh, in order to show to the public uh, something that normally remains you know, back of house. They've brought it to the front of house. Uh, they've featured objects that were found uh, in their storage areas throughout the reorg process, and they have uh, highlighted them on their, web on their Facebook page. And that sometimes created a lot of uh, enthusiasm from the community, and they said, oh, I remember that sign when I was... Uh, when I was a kid and I, you know, I remember where it hung, can I come and see it at the museum? So they've really kind of created this, they opened up this dialogue between them and the community about storage and about collections care and I think it was really, really successful. Um, another uh, aspect that falls under the social uh, dimension is that they've engaged volunteers in a new way. Um, so just really um, transferring the knowledge that they've gained throughout the training to uh, their volunteers and, and the people that are helping out. Um, another way uh, that some groups have uh, engaged their community is through behind-the-scenes tours. So uh, some groups did a behind-the-scenes tour before the reorg, which you wouldn't think to do necessarily. You want to show the nice reorganized storage area, but they actually thought it was important to show the starting point of their project, and so they showed what the situation was before and where we ended up after all the work that we did. And so this was really, really popular. And another thing that was done was to engage the media. So all of the teams uh, sent out press releases of their projects when they started, when they got their funding, uh, before and after. Uh, so they got their, their um their media and the general public really, really involved, and it's really showed the benefits of reorganized storage not only to the institution but to the wider, uh, to you know, to society as a whole. So it was really, really successful. 
And so to end, I'd just like to mention that a sustainable reorg, sustainable storage reorg, should engage the community if it's to be successful in the long term, uh, if it's to uh, yield uh, positive results, and should be cost efficient. So we should look at ways to um, use your resources wisely as long as it's safe for the collection. And ideally, you would really want to have a, a lower impact on the environment. And that's really at the core of reorg is making the best with what you have. So I thank you for your time. And I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Simon. Uh, we actually do have some fairly complicated questions. But I think we will hold those till the end. And mm -hmm. um, Uh, sorry, we're changing screens here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe uh, Geneva will be introducing our next speaker. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next presenter is Ashley McGrew. Ashley is Chair of Publications for PACIN, or Preparation Art Handling Collections Care Network. He's also a preparator at the Cantor Center for the Arts at Stanford University and an editor for STASH. Storage Techniques for Art, Science, and History. Ashley's work draws upon practical solutions within both institutional and commercial collections care. Ashley, take it away. Thank you very much. Let's see, uh, see if my screen will come up. By the way, while it's happening, I can go ahead and, and uh, start basically uh, uh, I'm a preparator, and I'm going to try and uh, reproduce as much as possible of a, of a previous workshop that was done uh, as a part of ASC's annual meeting. Um, uh, and so I'm going to be talking fairly quickly to try and include as much as possible. You can see the title of the, the thing there, and you can also see if you want to find out more about us, go to www.packin.org. Um, so, so, okay. Yeah, Ashley, you should have the mouse and the uh, keyboard control. All right, I'm not advancing for some reason. That's not ah, There we go. No. No, we don't. So this worked last time. Well, I, are you ready to share your desktop? Uh, let I can um, yeah I can do that as an alternative. Let me get it. Um, let me get into that. Sorry. Oh, this. Hold on just a second. Okay. You're not seeing anything yet, I don't suppose. Uh, well, I haven't haven't turned the desktop over okay. to you yet. OK, very good. Yeah. There we go. OK, so I've turned over. Uh, you'll need to start sharing your screen. All right. There we Do go. we have anything yet? Yes, perfect. All right, very good. There was a slide I was uh, putting up to begin with uh, showing the title of the original uh, presentation. Very much relates to it. Here are some of the people that contributed uh, images. Um, and uh, the speakers as well. Um, basically, in terms of packing, one of the things that is the very worst uh, that you could do is what we do now, which is the use of these uh, custom gluten crates. This very kind of unique to uh, uh, the northern hemisphere uh, or, or the uh, North America in particular. And uh, so we're looking at in this uh, conversation about different alternatives to that. Um, and a focus on systematic or cyclical pack, packing approaches that will be more efficient, more flexible to be able to uh, provide for reuse. Um, also utilizing resources in the sense of 
having uh, effort and resources go into mounts that can be used for different purposes, including storage, handling, uh, and packing. And then there's a little bit uh, covered here uh, on storage applications that are kind of related. Um, one thing just, just to point out, if, if you're moving collections, you're not really in the sustainable arena because you're, you're you know, by nature you're using uh, uh, you know, oil-based petroleum products to just move things pretty much anywhere. Even if someone's using a material that is arguably sustainable because it's like farmed wood, a lot of that gets shipped from China, so that kind of uh, uh, undermines that effort. There is one thing that's just kind of interesting, not so much uh, because it's instantly usable, but because it's, uh, it points out that things are possible, and that's this product uh, that is owned currently by Seal Bear, who does bubble wrap and ethophone. And it actually uh, is, um, it actually it consists of uh, agricultural waste that's inoculated with uh, with a, a fungus of different sorts to where the mycelium will actually bind stuff together. So essentially you're making a kind of a organic uh, styrofoam. Um, you know, while that's very exciting and, and uh, you know, we certainly hope it gets used for us in the uh, uh, museum world, the, the whole function of that uh, kind of product is that it works for one impact and then it breaks. So if you're ready to roll the dice, you can do that. You can calculate an acceptable uh, loss rate the way you do with a, a commercial product, but we don't have that luxury. So we are basically stuck in, with some of the materials uh, that are not so sustainable, like a, a, a series of different kinds of foams. We can still minimize that, though. Um, and uh, one of the things we can do is look at crate reuse. Um, and in fact, that uh, the slide from the beginning um, that had the crates up on a pallet racks, those were not new crates. Those are actually crates that are available for reuse from a commercial vendor. You're not going to know about those if you don't ask for them. Um, that's something that the, the use of that is on the increase uh, here in the States but it's still relatively rare. And uh, uh, where you do find a lot of other uh, kind of reuse are uh, in Europe. Uh, here's one from the UK that these are rentable crates. Um, the Netherlands seems to be a center for it. Here's a crystal crates that have adjustable interiors. Most of these crate designs um, are best for 2D, so it's kind of limiting based on your collection. <clears throat> Most well-known one is the cradle crate. It also is adjustable inside. The same company though does use um, uh, these stackable uh, lidded crates, uh, small crates you see on the left. They've got sort of a bean bag kind of uh, interior that people use uh, over and over again. Uh, that doesn't do you that much good, but you can find a similar product available from uh, New Haven uh, Moving Materials here. Have many offices across the United States. So you see that on the right. Um, there are other things you can rent as well. This is a, these are fairly ugly, but they are fairly functional, and they're basically book carts, um, which, if you're moving a collection of books, can be good. That's also these are also from uh, New Haven, and were used in a, a move of the art school next to the museum I work in. Uh, the main thing to think about here is that they can be uh, altered with uh, a little bit of ingenuity and some understanding of uh, basic principles of packing into other uses. Um, some things that have been tried, going again with something that's very durable and very lightweight and potentially stackable are this, uh, these crates, the like carding crates uh, or cases. Um, the problem with them is that they are hard to work with, basically. These typically would be filled with foam to be cavity packed, which is uh, not very sustainable, obviously, but, but they can also be like for tray packed for a smaller 2D. So those are some options. Uh, another version of that is put out by Pelican Crate uh, uh, case people that they're more, a little more durable, and I, I understand there's a, a, a successful uh, project that was undertaken to take they do a lot of work for the military, and there was a successful project taking a missile uh, uh, crate and using it for rolled textiles for multiple uses, uh, uh, getting international travel. Um, the big thing, though, in 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 the the big view and the realistic view is is how you approach packing and, and doing so in a systematic way. Uh, that seems to be 
the most accessible and, and useful thing to be aware of. And here we just see a, a, a commercial pallet, uh, basically, that has boxes of different sizes. And you notice up on the top, we have a layer of four. We have uh, a layer of three here that kind of puzzle together. Being able to, to have different boxes that can, uh, can be put together into a, a single cube uh, allows it, you to have the flexibility to fit different objects in different ways, different weights as well. Um, the most well-known version of that is probably National Museum of American Indian that used uh, a, a collapsible three-part uh, commercial uh, pallet system um, uh, during uh, their move project. And here you can see the tin box sizes that could be puzzled together um, to, to make that happen. Uh, that that seems very limiting, but actually, I mean, when you get past the totem poles and the uh, long weapons and uh, kayaks and such, most of the collection did fit into two drawer sizes, uh, the smaller here being archaeological and the larger being ethnographic, that uh, did fit uh, quite well into a basic footprint of a, of a pallet. Uh, so in this case, you see the stack being uh, uh, created and puzzled together, and these are the components uh, when they're folded up, which is what would be uh, how they would live until they were being used, uh, they'd be put together and loaded and sent down to uh, Suitland, Maryland, where they'd be unloaded and sent back. Uh, collapse like this again, you can see, it takes uh, it really adds up how much space they have. And it consisted of polyethylene bases uh, that were molded, looked like a regular pallet. In this case, they have a, a 10 mil uh, coroplast sleeve to create the walls of the box, and then uh, a molded top that uh, clips together with those yellow clips. Uh, interior components that were uh, made by NMAI were uh, cushions for different weight uh, uh, accumulations of the cube, and uh, then uh, so they would be put underneath, and side cushions would be put in, uh, the whole thing clipped together, and in this, this case, these are stackable. Um, that was very, very important in this uh, application and uh, in terms of other sort of implications. But right here we see that those uh, units, when stacked side by side, basically fill the space in this uh, tractor trailer uh, rental unit. And um, when you consider that most art uh, that's being shipped or objects being shipped in normal crates, uh, they're usually not stackable, and they only take up normally a fraction of the available space, whereas this uses the, all the usable space, essentially. That red line indicates the minimum amount of space needed to be able to circulate the air for the uh, air handling uh, unit. Um, and also, the stacking also uh, implies another potential use for these that uh, uh, has yet to be fully exploited, and that is, uh, here you see a bunch of these are located on the uh, loading dock, but one of the things during the move process, actually, there would be times when uh, the packing end, I, I supervised the packing for this, uh, this project, and we would uh, get ahead of the, the housing end, and so luckily that would not really kill them, especially because they could leave these things stacked up uh, within storage. Um, actually, a, the, a, a good use of this came uh, during another move project, um, that took place a few years later in uh, Los Angeles at the Southwest Museum of the American Indian, which was another kind of rescue uh, situation where a, a, a failing uh, collect, uh, a museum collection was uh, saved. And in this case, it was done by the Autry Museum of the American West. Um, and here you can see where, in that case, they had to get it out of a, a problem building and into an off-site storage building that did not yet have uh, uh, furnishings. But in this case, it was not such a problem in that these uh, stack three high and three deep is a very, very efficient use of space. And uh, the way they're set up with the right equipment, one person can get in and safely get access to the material in there, because we all know there's no such thing as the moratorium on uh, exhibitions. And um, in this case, it's just it's super efficient compactor storage. Luckily, all the packing material they used in with the interior as well as the units themselves were uh, inert. Uh, so uh, taking the same approach, the systematic approach, and going back in time, 
this is a, a system that existed back in the days of Fine Arts Express, that was the first big company that basically uh, popularized the use of the art shuttle that minimized uh, cost for people moving their collections across the country. And it was a, a, something called a Mac Pack, which is basically a series of boxes that can be uh, stacked together because they have the same footprint but have different depths to accommodate whatever materials you're putting into them. Um, they were typically shipped in a very, very simplified crate that you see here that's primarily three-quarter inch uh, plywood and uh, two-by-fours in the joints that make, a, make for a very broad glue joint. So they're very strong, actually. And these, uh, these crate shells would be reused with different configurations of the boxes inside over and over again. Uh, I worked in the New York office of FAE, and we would see these things come and go, and I always thought it was truly awesome how smaller museums were able to circulate their uh, exhibitions or loans or what have you um, uh, just by reusing these instead of having to pay for new crates. Um, here's a, uh, an example from our workshop where you can see a stack of them with uh, the, a four-inch box at the top. Uh, with an 8 below that, a 10 below that, and a 12 at the bottom, which is the deepest. It's missing the 6, which is uh, very handy. The traditional way to pack in these was, though, basically cavity packing into uh, uh, gray foam, hopefully your uh, polyurethane uh, ester. Not very efficient, uh, not very uh, sustainable, and it basically generate a lot of waste. Uh, and you're using a lot of material that's harder to uh, recycle or whatever. Um, what was interesting is looking at uh, bringing some of the newer methods uh, developed at NMAI back to the backpack, to the, that box system. Uh, in, in that MOVE project, we basically went towards highly visible packing systems where uh, it virtually eliminated loose fill and you can see what, uh, what you're handling and it also enabled us to be able to pack objects that were in their storage mounts um, uh, ahead of time, uh, which is really handy. This was uh, enabled to a large degree with the use of a couple uh, unusual materials for packing at that time. It is high density polyethylene, very, very thin uh, uh, polyethylene that doesn't seem to have plasticizers or slip agents, and uh, is basically like a tissue. and it's. Uh, very affordable. One source that's been tested uh, repeatedly is this Husky brand, uh, uh, basically painter's plastic. And then on, on the right you see uh, this uh, stretch wrap, the linear low density polyethylene uh, by Good Wrappers has also been oddly tested in multiple institutions and seemed to fare very well. Um, it's also, the, the plastic is worth noting, is very inexpensive. You're basically looking at half a penny a square foot. So is something any institution can take advantage of. Um, if we uh, look beyond that, though, there are, there are other things. You know, when you're shipping 2D work, there's the use of the slip case um, for many years. And, um, and basically, 3D uh, uh, slip casing is available in the form of uh, pre-existing commercial uh, containers. And here, this is called a, a D container. and it, uh, Basically, is something off the shelf that sits on a pallet. So it has the advantages in terms of safety of movement that you have uh, when you move something by a pallet. You're only lifting it uh, basically an inch off the ground, and uh, you're not going to have a topple incident. And it's mostly recyclable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, sorry about that. Okay, off screen. And um, so there you can see a, you know material going into one of those. Uh, some of the newer product designs are trying to eliminate wood altogether, which is an admirable notion there. They have a, you can see a corrugated cardboard skid. Um, they can also be custom done by uh, your art service people or in within the museum. Uh, see a, a stacking box system that's kind of unified on the left. You can see one on the right that has uh, 2D uh, objects uh, designed to go into those slots. As well, another advantage of having commercially available uh, systems in places, there are products that you can buy off the shelf, one being uh, like gusseted plastic bags that fit, uh, that are pallet covers, and also, in some cases, you might even want to use insulated covers uh, to give you a little more protection in terms of uh, temperature. Um, 
the thing about uh, these wood and cardboard containers is that it's, it's not new. It's been done for a long time in some instances. And so here's an example from CCI, who I love. They're very practical about in their approach. And um, where those are wood strips on the ends only where the joints go. And uh, very lightweight and durable. Um, National Park Service had a conservagram with a similar approach, although a little more simplified. And, and so here's a real-life example of one where basically a uh, uh, museum in the Midwest was putting together a show of gowns, uh, textiles, that had uh, uh, four lenders in the uh, Los Angeles area with a bunch of uh, material from each. And they were going to be packed already in uh, these blue board boxes. Uh, that they were stored in. They just needed a way to basically carry them. Uh, and, and so a simplified box like this is, is perfectly a fine and effective without having to go to the full expense of a full crate. And because they're of a similar size, they basically are stackable as well. Plus, they just provide better access to some of these uh, lenders' uh, uh, locations that don't have a loading dock. Um, finally, the, uh, the, the thing is most interesting that I've seen uh, looking at containerization uh, or lack thereof uh, took place in New Orleans and it was a project uh, for the Louisiana State Museum put together by Greg Lambuzzi and the uh, staffing and management of the, the, the crew was done by the Williamstown Art Conservation Center uh, with a uh, with the, the head honcho being uh, Katie Holbrow and the on-site supervisor being Allison McCloskey. Um, the, the conditions that were dealt with there uh, were the evacuation of the uh, uh, collection initially, um, where the, the, the biggest risk was not necessarily from the, the damage to the building itself. Here you can see they did have some leaks, but the big risk was the loss of power. And in that environment, if, uh, if you can't uh, maintain climate, you're basically going to be growing things all over all your objects. So the need was to evacuate it to a site where it could be um, uh, you know, taken care of in terms of minimal climate requirements. And so the, the closest place they could find a large enough space for their 200,000 objects was in Baton Rouge. This is a warehouse of an empty warehouse from a building supply uh, company. And you can see they, they, they got the stuff there by hook or by crook with whatever boxes and whatever manpower they could get together after the uh, uh, hurricane had hit. Uh, our job was to, because I consulted on this with uh, uh, Williamstown, uh, was to uh, figure out how to most efficiently and effectively get it moved back into the new storage that had been renovated and improved uh, in the meantime. Unfortunately, during that time, the collection sat basically most of it on the ground uh, in an area that is not, you know, uh, protected from insects. So we had not only had to worry about uh, uh, that aspect of uh, sort of preemptive uh, uh, pest management, but also these were packed in a hurry. There was no guarantee they couldn't go back in the same boxes. They would have to be repacked to some degree. We didn't have condition reports to even really know what we were up against. Um, so, um, the, the, um, I don't know. the uh, in addition to freezing, we uh, basically tried to focus on what do we know we want, and what we know we wanted is the um, the, the use of high quality storage and handling mounts that would minimize impact on the uh, collection. Uh, in use, and uh, what we decided to do uh, to, to, to end up with uh, that result and, and minimize the handling of the process was actually do away with containers altogether. And uh, the way we did that was by utilizing these uh, Nextel or, or uh, wire carts that uh, metro carts, whatever you call them, that are very popular these days uh, in all sorts of aspects around the museum. In this case, they became basically a mobile crate with the addition of uh, polyurethane convoluted foam, it's the eggshell kind of foam, where a couple layers of that was highly responsive to lightweight objects and heavier objects would sink down into it and receive the cushioning they need. And basically with the use of this high density polyethylene, the 
uh, individual uh, storage mounts or individual objects, depending on their nature, uh, could be uh, wrapped in a layer of that, placed on a shelf with other objects, another layer uh, of uh, high density placed over that, and the whole thing, um, uh, all the objects could be secured onto the shelf itself using uh, the stretch wrap that we discussed earlier. Um, then the whole thing would be, I keep doing that, stop that. Um, uh, then the whole thing would be encased in the layer of polyethylene, uh, and uh, the overlap in the corners would be clamped shut, avoiding the use of tape and uh, enable us to reuse them uh, with uh, pipe insulation. Uh, basically, they purchased a fleet of these that um, could be put on a truck to go down to be unloaded and with uh, the other units uh, left on site to uh, uh, be packed, essentially, and then they just had a rotational system. There's a cyclical packing system. Um, so here you can see one of the major advantages as well as the, 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 the Mint building, which was uh, the facility that we were uh, moving the objects to had very limited access. So luckily these carts could uh, negotiate through the narrow uh, uh, passageways and could roll right up next to where the shelving is uh, that they were going on to. You can see here that uh, they uh, basically could just cut loose, uh, they remove the outer layer, cut loose the uh, polyethylene, uh, linear low density polyethylene, and unwrap the top wrapper, and basically put them straight on the shelf. So we've minimized the handling and, and create almost no waste uh, in the process at all. Um, just as a little aside that uh, came across afterwards was that even with all these extra parts that everyone, uh, I think, always finds uses for, if, if you did have extra to use, they actually can now be configured into sort of a mini compactor storage system. So uh, that's an option uh, worth thinking about. Uh, here are some of the products that uh, were mentioned. Um, thank you very much. I'm sorry if I went over. Well, thank you. Uh, Abigail, I think we have a uh, quick question for him. Yes, this is a question from Hildegard asking, is the Kiva system available in Europe and or Germany? That's that's something I don't know the answer to. I, w I, I think it'd be, it's hard to imagine that it's not in some form. It exists here in a bunch of different forms. The key thing there, in my experience though, is, is you have to have knowledgeable people that are dealing with the interior packing. That's always the, the crux of it. Okay, thank you. Geneva? All right, thank you, Ashley. Our final presenter is Rebecca Fifield. Becky is head of Rebecca Fifield Preservation Services with experience working in the collections departments of several world-renowned museums. She serves as the chair of the AIC Collection Care Network, promoting preventive conservation planning for all levels of institutions. So welcome, Becky. Thanks, Geneva. Um, I'm going to transition our discussion now by talking about some of the social and economic aspects of um, how we care for our collections and how this supports organizational sus sustainability. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about managing preservation work over time, um, how great storage sustains our organizations by making collections readily accessible to users. And I'm going to talk a bit about the spaces we work in and the work we're doing. And uh, I'm going to talk about how we connect with our colleagues and the public about sustainability and caring for cultural heritage. There we go. Okay, hey, so if you're participating in this webinar, you're likely familiar with the difficulties in getting attention for preventive conservation activities. And yet we know that for collections to be accessible for exhibitions, photography, and research, we have to protect them from damage. So in uh, 2004, Heritage Preservation and IMLS collaborated on a survey of U.S. institutional preservation practices that resulted in the Heritage Health Index report. And included in the survey were questions about storage, emergency preparedness, staffing, and policy. And uh, yes, an updated report based on 2014 data will be available in 2016, so new data is coming. But what the uh, 2004 project found was that 
Less than 20% of private nonprofits of all sizes indicated that they had a dedicated paid staff with the responsibility of care of collections, and less than 12% of collections surveyed had their collections fully inventoried. And if you look at the uh, chart on the right, um, it, it gets to be about 40% um, in uh, having no staff person available to care for collections in tribal and county and municipal collections. So not understanding what's in our collection not only makes it so we can't find it for our users, but we can't begin to prioritize what collections may need for specialized storage, such as Simon discussed in the reorg project. So UNESCO has recognized the role of cultural heritage as the fourth pillar of sustainable development and has called for a mainstreaming of culture in the international development agenda. And preservation management is key for maintaining physical cultural heritage so it may fulfill that role. So I'd like to ask my first poll question now. Um, does your museum's sustainability program include long-term preservation management considerations or goals? And your answers may be yes, no, or we don't have a sustainability program. Well, we have about half of the participants have logged in so far. We'll give them a moment, about two-thirds, three-fourths. Eighty <laughs> percent. Uh, so far, more than half say they don't have a sustainability program. I'll give this Two more beats for last votes, and we'll close the poll and share it. There are the results. Wow, okay. That was better than I expected, and I'd love to hear from you folks where your sustainability program at your institution includes long-term preservation considerations. I would love to know how that's handled, and I want to hear a talk on it at an AIC meeting in the future. <laughs> so, I, but for, uh, and certainly 50% of organizations didn't have a sustainability program. I think this is amazing considering the amount of time we spend in caring for collections, especially those on display where we have to dust collections. Uh, the Economics of Dust um, project at the National Trust in the UK found that 75% of their staff time contributed to uh, dusting collections in period rooms alone. And I think with that kind of input going into collection care, we need to, con we need to consider it when, uh, when we're considering organizational sustainability. So why, oops, looks like my, there we go. So, I would like to th think about sometimes why some of the challenges we have about um, implementing uh, preservation and thinking about it over the long term. I think that preservation takes place over hundreds of years and we as mere mortals can only be responsible for a fraction of that time. And at the same time, we're providing collection access through short-term projects with concrete deliverables and deadlines such as exhibitions and, and publication projects. And juggling these two sets of responsibilities with two very different time horizons can cause conflict in the balance of preservation and access. So I would like to say that if collections drive our exhibitions and programming, then collection preservation is the basis of organizational sustainability. So we all know that collections are, that are well cared for in storage can more readily transition to use. Optimal storage limits or eliminates the need for costly conservation treatment in order to make the collection usable. I think many of us have had the experience of not being able to accommodate a researcher um, due to not having enough staff to work with them or there's a suboptimal storage crate that we just can't manage to get open in the time window we have to work with that person or we can't make uh, objects available for exhibition because we don't have the time or resources to, to uh, secure conservation treatment. And I think this has given preservation professionals a no reputation, like no, we can't, when really I think of us as very creative people who figure out how to say yes on a daily basis. 
So let's talk about some ways which we can highlight how improved preservation management helps us say yes. Okay, we're going to create a vision and we're going to connect with our allies and uh, we're going to wear our OptiVisors while, we, while doing it. So um, we need to advocate that preservation sustains our organizations and it's worth doing well. Um, we might need to ask a few questions such as what does successful access to collections in our institutions look like for various stakeholders? And what might that access look like in the future? What, what kind of things do we want to implement where um, different audiences that our, our museums um, work with um, want to access collections in certain ways? And what collections are expected to grow in importance for projected audiences? And do our current preservation systems support that access? I think we also need to communicate data about how improved storage and preservation systems would improve how we serve collections now. If you serve a certain number of researchers, prepare a certain number of loans, prep for a certain uh, number of photographs in a year, have your team brainstorm about how better storage or preservation systems might facilitate extending that outreach and share that with administrators. At the same time you are developing this vision, um, connect with institutional allies and collaborate with them to refine the vision. I think we've all been involved in projects where not the right people aren't involved and that hinders the, the distance we can go with that project. And allies can come from any sector within the museum uh, because we're all integral in some way to preservation and access to the collections. Your allies might be registrars, collection managers, preparators, curators, educators, development, people interested in emergency preparedness and business continuity such as IT, security, facilities, health and safety, and finance officers. That's pretty much anybody who you can corner in an elevator. Um, hey, share your message with them. A project that helps you bring together ideas about how to manage preservation and work better with the whole complement of colleagues that contribute to preservation is a collection risk assessment. And I think that the um, cultural property risk analysis model, which was developed by um, Rob Waller, he, um, whoops, sorry, I accidentally tapped my screen. Um, it measures the probability and extent of risks, specific risks to collections, enabling staff to prioritize the application of limited preservation funds to those risks, most likely to occur with the greatest damage to collections. And importantly, it's an, a project that helps build bridges with your allies from engineering, security, and other departments. I think we've all um, had that issue where we've, we've um, not connected over preservation issues, and this is definitely a project that can help you do that. So, um, and collection risk assessment helps us use our preservation funds wisely, lower overall collection risk by targeting the highest risks, and provides a tool for future preservation management um, while highlighting opportunities for preservation investment. So it's important to remember that through preservation, we're not just preventing damage, we're ensuring and enhancing access to cultural heritage over time. So let's think about ways we can raise visibility for preservation during our everyday work we're doing now. Uh, if you're a conservator, during treatment documentation, indicate what specific preservation practices or resources could have prevented or limited the damage you are now treating, and report this annually to build data for funding support. If you're a registrar, collections manager, technician, curator, preparator, others, um, how are we communicating to administration how the lack of robust preservation management systems impacts collection use? How are we documenting when we have to say no to users? Um, are we, is, there a, is there a preservation control that could have protected that access? Incorporate a preservation component into whatever system your institution is using to collect overall data about collection use. Annual reporting can be used to make decisions about needed preservation policy, procedures, and resources. I'd like to talk a little bit about sustainability of our staff. When museums cut the collection care staff, I would like to challenge, are they actually saving money? Is preservation of collections considered to be negotiable when budgets are tight? 
And does this create greater risk for insurance and workers' comp claims? Are we spending more in the long run on conservation treatment to make collections usable? I think cutting collection care staff also cut, uh, creates other inefficiencies as other staff attempts to juggle their responsibilities, um, which might also, again, increase insurance claims. In creating situations of burnout, uh, the institution experiences hidden costs related to turnover and phased out positions. And I, I don't have enough time to talk about all the issues about sustainability and training of staff. I think that there is a, a real opportunity for the Sustainability Committee and Professional Committee at AIC to talk about um, training of conservators, collection managers, technicians, comparators. Um, and, and the sustainability of what we have to put into now um, in our careers. I would, however, just like to bring up this really great program, um, training program. This is the Veterans Curation Program, and this um, has great social um, sustainability components to it. This is a project of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They maintain millions of archaeological collections from their projects. And they developed a program in which they train veterans returning from overseas to uh, catalog, photograph, and uh, perform basic collections care for the collections. So it's a really nice combination of training, um, supporting cultural heritage, supporting um, our veterans, and also, um, again, supporting access to those collections over time. Let's talk about the spaces in which preservation work takes place and how changing our spaces and, and thinking about this can make our practice sustainable and even energizing. Uh, many of us have had to work in situations where health and safety were at stake due to poor ventilation, maybe small spaces hindered working with some objects or the uh, or that really big uh, blue board, cutting <laughs> big pieces of blue board, or uh, maybe the bright equipment wasn't available because of our, our space constraints. And when nonprofits gamble with staff safety and safety of collections, institutional reputation is at stake. So partner with health and safety staff or advisors to improve or create space that sustains both the work and the worker, because we've all been stuck in the basement at some point, I think. Um, I also think sustainability is at its best when we can incorporate the reuse of equipment and available space, but not if it in introduces additional risks. So let's balance the reuse of found furniture with the sustainability of the staff. Um, I think salvaged tables and chairs at the wrong working height don't really meet sustainability goals if they lead to repetitive stress injuries and downtime. So um, some of the ways we can work on the spaces that we work in, survey colleagues as to what equipment, space, and skills they need to make their work better. Um, hold a brainstorming session. How can we improve work practice so that collections are more readily available for use? Um, just review processes, of preparing work for ex exhibition, photography, loan, and other collection uses. Um, and make that end goal about visitor experience. Don't get bogged down in the practicalities of what's going on now, but what could possibly be. And think outside of administrative silos. If you're in a larger institution, does every collection department need the same equipment, like a mat cutter, sewing machine, washer and dryer? The answer might be met, yes, but the answer might be no. Um, if preparators have traditionally been scattered in spaces throughout the building, in what ways can creating a consolidated preservation workspace improve conditions, save on equipment purchases, allow investment in better equipment, and create a natural space to swap archival material scraps and underused tools and equipment? And then also think about what functions have traditionally not worked within the preparation space that you have right now, and what staff might work together in new ways to spark creativity. Um, I also challenge someone um, to uh, think about how great design can help preserve collections in our prep spaces. I think we've all seen beautiful conservation labs designed, but what about our prep spaces? I think that there's a high level of risk there for collections and workers, and that I think we should combine sustainability, health and safety, um, and, and design a great space, and then you know, apply for a grant and combine that with an education component so we can educate other museums about um, the findings. So I think this would be really brilliant for the field.
If you're a small institution, uh, partner with local and regional museums to improve sustainable preservation practices. Um, you could take advantage of equipment and supplies purchasing discounts. I'm from Maryland, hence the County Historical Society is from Maryland there. Um, a, a project I'd like to highlight is Sustaining Places. This is a program that helps extend preservation of small museum collections in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, they have an equipment sharing program, which is managed by University of Delaware Museum Studies students, and it's funded by an IMLS 21st Century Museum uh, Professionals Program grant. Uh, they, uh, smaller institutions can borrow things like milfisk vacuums and photography and environmental monitoring equipment. And this project uh, provides a little uh, training on how to do basic collections care. And it helps smaller museums get introduced to best practices without making prohibitively expensive equipment purchases up front. Another idea is to host an equipment, tools, and supplies exchange event. Uh, participant institutions can benefit not only by cleaning out their equipment storage areas, but also acquiring items they may need. And this is a good way to swap archival supply scraps, too. Um, you could um, pair the exchange event with a training opportunity, such as how to make Tyvek pillows and weights, which you can get instructions to do on my website there. It's down in the corner. Um, you could host tours of renovation or storage rehousing projects. Um, or you could host, um, another idea is to uh, host an informational exchange about how you get preservation done at your organization. AIC's Collection Care Network created the Collection Care Information Exchange Discussion Framework. It's available at the AIC website on the Collections Care page, which you can see right here under Publications and Resources. You just have to scroll down to it. Um, it's available for no cost. It's a very simple tool that's just a a pretty much a bullet points of things to talk about when you get together with your colleagues in small institutions um, or big institutions. Uh, and, and this tool uh, builds preservation practice among partner institutions that may have limited funds for travel or co to conferences or workshops. And additionally, working together locally reduces the environmental impact of travel. Um, and then in the end, create an outreach component. Let the community know how your institutions in your area are helping each other to boost preservation of their cultural heritage. So if anybody um, has done a swap event, um, I'd love to know about it. Or if anybody um, tries our Collections Care Information Exchange discussion framework, I'd love to hear how it went and uh, any improvements we can make. I think in the end, we have to get the public involved. I think conservation treatment can show thrilling contrasts through before and after photography, but preservation work can't always do that. And our message to the public about preservation has to be about supporting the programs and exhibitions um, our public enjoys. So I'd like to have our, our final poll question here. How many uh, work at institutions that provide an opportunity for visitors to learn about preservation activities? And uh, I'm excluding conservation treatment here, like open conservation labs. Um, if you have a website or maybe you do some tours, um, I'd love to know about that here. But this would really be about preventive conservation. Well, we have about a third, well, 40% all coming in here. About two thirds say they do have some kind of opportunity. Great. We'll give it a couple more seconds. We're at 80% have voted. Eighty-six percent going once, going twice. I think that may be it. So there are our results. Great. I think for those folks, 66% um, totally uh, blew me out of the water. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, I want to hear more about what institutions are doing to share this information. Um, are they ha hosting websites like the Denver Art Museum or Colonial Williamsburg or the South Dakota Historical Society? Um, the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, which we saw a couple slides back, um, has an open window on their paleontological lab, which highlights the real challenges of managing a museum collection. Um, maybe you could host a staff spotlight tour where just um, you have an informal conversation with uh, a changing variety of staff members uh, about how their, what they contribute to preservation of the collections. Maybe you can uh, pair a, a 
maintaining a, a, a work of art, dusting a sculpture um, with an education session on what you're doing and uh, maybe how to clear up for collections at home. And I think we should really identify a preservation education component to all projects we're doing in the museum as much as we can. Um, like preservation and sustainability, I think we're educating our public about the long term, about what preservation of cultural heritage requires. And we may not be able to assess the benefits of this work immediately, or we need to develop tools to assess the benefits, but we're building greater awareness among our audiences over time. So um, to conclude, I'd, I'd like to just say we should think about um, what our institutions' stakeholders expect from our organizations in terms of sustainability and in caring for the collections it holds in public trust. Ultimately, reputation, organizational sustainability, and care of collections are intertwined, I think, as we're seeing currently with the Illinois State Museum closure and the potential loss of American Alliance for Museum accreditation. So think about how preservation activities support your institution's reputation as a steward of collections for your audiences, be they local, national, or international. All right, uh, and thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, we have some time for questions. I know Abigail has been collecting many interesting uh, questions, and I'll turn it over to her to start asking those. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> we had a question for Simon, which is, what should an institution do about caring for their collection if they don't know what their objects are made of? Also, what about historic houses where the collection and visiting humans are in the same space? Um, okay, that's that's a good question. If you don't know what your collection is made of, I think the um, the uh, the tables that I showed um, uh, in my presentation uh, allows you to come at it from the object types. So you'll know that they're paintings, you'll know that they're audio recordings, you'll know that they're videotapes, you'll know what they are. And so even if you don't know the composition, if you, if you don't know if they're organic, inorganic, um, that's besides the point. You can actually, actually probably better <laughs> if you come at it from that end of things. Um, and as far as historic houses go, uh, within the context of a storage reorganization, I'm not quite clear what the, the question is, but um, definitely uh, uh, if, if this institution has a collection that's in storage, uh, there are ways to, um, you know, uh, do a storage reorganization for that institution as well. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, this one is for Ashley. Uh, we have a question that is, what should we look for in crates if we are new to this field or this position? Wow, that's, that's a very good question. Um, and that's something that as an organization we're getting ready to address. Um, there's a number of factors that uh, that are included. One of the problems with those other uh, the commercial available crates, where I would I would basically say two inches of cushioning. I think that's been an established thing for a long time at a bare minimum uh, on the interior. Um, beyond that, you want to create as many sub environments as as you can uh, uh, within it. Uh, basically just to stabilize uh, you know, temperature, humidity issues. But in terms of standards, there's, they're kind of uh, uh, scattered. Packin does have some publications that are available um, that show illustrations of, of standard packing or crating approaches uh, that you can uh, find out about by going on our website. Um, but in terms of a real concise kind of a guide, that's something that we're actually working on right now. Good to hear it. Um, we have another question, this one's for Becky. Uh, how do you balance using paid and volunteer staff when it comes to sustainable time management? <laughs> There's so many things wrapped up in that question. I think we've all had really great volunteer experiences and not so great volunteer experiences. 
One is hiring the right volunteers for the job and assigning the right tasks and um, learning to delegate uh, as well. Um, I had a great volunteer experience uh, with uh, people when I worked in, you introduced me as a large museum person, but a lot of my volunteer management experience comes from working in small institutions. I used to work at one of those county, Maryland County Historical Societies, and I had a great collection uh, committee. And um, I would create things like padded hanger kits um, with instructions and uh, I'd pack them up with materials and hand them out to my volunteers. That was a great way that I could boost my, my um, reorganization of my collection very quickly uh, using volunteer labor and using appropriate skill sets. Uh, my collections committee were very handy with, with uh, putting shelving together, so I was able to um, get uh, new shelving put together very quickly with them. So it's it's a combination of knowing your, knowing your skill set and knowing um, your volunteers and, uh, you know, meeting their needs as well um, in their volunteer opportunity, but also being able to know when it's not a good fit. Okay. Um, we have a few questions coming in from the uh, audience. And again, as a reminder, just go ahead and submit those. Uh, even if we don't get to them today, we'll certainly make sure that we get you answers to send out later on. So this one goes back to Simon. What are some suggestions you have for sustainably managing a collection that relies mostly on volunteers, uh, such as material waste, efficient use of time, etc.? Increasing an institution's sustainability often comes with pushback. How would you recommend convincing skeptical people who have to agree with you? <laughs> um, yeah, that, that can happen. Um, the, um, I think one of the things about uh, Storage Reorg, which is what I was focusing on for this specific talk, was um, it's, it's storage is kind of a loaded thing, and it has a lot of... Um, it's kind of a sensitive issue because often it's something that's not seen by everyone that might, uh, it, to various degrees, might have been neglected over time or you might not have time to devote the attention that you would like to, to it. And so it ends up the way it looks like now. And so when someone wants to do something about it, uh, you might get some resistance from that. So what's worked really well in the past is, is showing uh, impactful um, before and after pictures of uh, reorganized storage areas. Uh, so projects that have managed to overcome those issues and to do it successfully. And these are the kinds of things that we're working into our reorg material um, in terms of providing uh, nice, neat case studies that show uh, you know, different institutions starting point and the details on the project and who was involved and how the results were achieved. Uh, and there are, there are cases where it's a bit more challenging to get that buy-in. And so um, I, uh, one of my uh, really close collaborators told me a story once about a very large institution, a very prominent institution that was facing really important challenges in storage. And um, the board uh, kept on, you know, not giving that aspect priority and then kind of pushing it aside and, you know, no, let's focus on exhibitions, let's focus on exhibitions. And at one time, uh, this person hired a professional photographer to come into the storage area and take really, really nice shots of what the storage area actually looked like and prepared a package at the next board meeting for all the people who were attending and laid it on the table for them. And then it got their attention. They're like, oh, okay, <laughs> we need to do something. So I mean, it's a combination of, of, of showing the potential risk and showing the benefits. It depends on each situation, but basically it's, it's putting the collection at risk uh, and it's also preventing it from being used for the museum's activities. So that should get some people interested. Can I hop in on this question too? Sure. Um, I, uh, yes, and I, I use the photos approach for emergency preparedness. It's really handy for that, too. <laughs> but, um, 
I also think about it depends um, what are the reasons that the person is skeptical. Usually it tends yeah. to do with more work, but maybe you can identify how things they're responsible for um, can be can be um, benefited by by sustainable approaches. You know, what why are they resistant? And uh, just demonstrating, hey, if we use this new system, this could also help you meet your goals. Uh, I think we have time for one last question. We will try to answer all the questions uh, offline, but I know some people have other, other things to go to. Okay, this last one is from Vanessa. <clears throat> and this can, um, this is to all of the presenters today. Is there a place where big museums can donate lightly used materials for smaller museums and institutions? Do any of you know of anything like that? No. No. I know in New York City there's materials for the arts. Um, it's not it's not museum specific. Um, but if you have a certain amount, they will come to your institution with a truck. You can schedule a time and they'll come and pick it up. But it is something that has, uh, you know, is really a regional component just due to the, you know, practicalities of shipping and storage and distribution of those materials. Sounds like uh, there's an opportunity to, uh, to expand that idea. Uh, well, I really want to thank everybody for their time. I don't want to take advantage of, of uh, your afternoon here. Uh, but so many thanks to uh, uh, Rebecca Fifield, Simon Lambert, Ashley McGrew for their presentations, to Geneva Griswold and Christian Hernandez for organizing this so well, uh, to the FAIC staff, Abigail Chaudhry and Sarah Satrian for their help behind the scenes here. And we would like to ask you to do two things to help make programs like this possible. First, please, please, please fill out the evaluation form that you will receive by email this afternoon. Uh, your feedback really helps us evaluate the workshop, the webinar, and improve its, uh, our future events. And second, uh, just please consider a donation to FAIC. Your contribution is tax deductible and it helps support programs like this along with scholarships for those needing financial assistance to attend in-person workshops. Uh, and the last pitch, if you have not already registered, uh, be sure to look for uh, our program next week, Tuesday, December 8th, on the Life Cycle Assessment Tool, a very interesting series of presentations. And we'll look for you there. Thank you all very much.